Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for connecting to this session of DCTV. This is a monthly happening that takes place on the second Tuesday of each month. It's a great opportunity for Distech Controls to give you precious insights on smart buildings, dealing with all the hot topics. We're gonna to be covering both the technological aspects as well as a return on experience. This is the third edition of DCTV. And the focus today is on healthy and trustworthy buildings. This is a hot topic indeed because companies are now transitioning back to the office. They want to reassure employees and visitors. They want people to make sure that they're moving around in a safe environment. So it's going to be very interesting to hear from our experts today. To my right, we have Laura Carminati. Hello. She is a product manager at Distech Controls. <clears throat> also, I'm pleased to announce two people, two experts connected from a distance in the UK. First of all, we have Brian Saxby, CEO and chairman at Aero. Brian, Good afternoon. welcome. Could you just give us a few words about Oero? Yes, certainly. So Oero was originally conceived as a human well-being project, looking at the built environment and how humans exist in these spaces. And a key principle of that, of course, is the atmosphere that we create around us, which is a lot more than just heating and cooling. So the research took us to look at how gas molecules themselves behave in different environments. And that research over the last seven years has led us to develop a new control algorithm, which has been patented and delivers uh, far superior indoor environments for the, for the buildings. Thank you very much. So I can certainly see why Oero and Distech Controls are strategic partners. We also have with us Simon Ward, the Director of Sales for Distech Controls in the UK and Ireland. Welcome, Simon. Thank you, Brad. And thank you, Brian, for your time today. Really appreciate uh, taking up some of your valuable time to talk about this, uh, this really interesting subject. During this live DC TV program, you can enter all of your questions into the chat. Our experts are going to be talking for about 30 minutes to share their insights with us. <clears throat> and after that, there'll be a 15 minute question and answer session. So let's jump into the heart of the subject, healthy and trustworthy buildings. First of all, what does that mean? And why is it so important? Ladies first, Laura. Thank you very much for the question. So today, People spend around 90% of their time in the building. We go to the work, we take children to study in the schools, we take our vacations, we are in a hotel room. So all the time we are in the buildings. What we want to do is to learn, to study, just to have fun and have this peace of mind. It's so important. At all stages of our lives that we want to be and to feel is to have and be in a healthy and trustworthy building. And with the pandemic, it's so much true. If you take example in Europe, for example, 40% of people are now working remotely. It was only 5% uh, before COVID. So yes, people do want to go back to work because the sense of belonging and of the community, we want to share the same, um, same things with all our colleagues. So yes, people want to go back to work, but it will be extremely important when they go back to the work, that they are feeling confident when they're going back and that they're in the building that is trustworthy. Thank you, Laura. Simon, what would you like to add to this? So I think really to get you know, a real understanding of this, we need to turn that question around and, and, and look at what an unhealthy building delivers. If we look at the air conditioning system, it's not really what you think in that it's conditioning air at all. It's mostly recirculated existing polluted air around the building environment, causing the buildup of CO2 and pollutants. CO2, as we all know, is associated with poor human performance, nausea, headaches and fatigue. Even many fully fledged air conditioning systems only offer rudimentary control and low levels of filtration. And I guess where that's really had a big impact is in, you know, these COVID challenge times with airborne viruses, a major health uh, hazard. The requirement goes up a notch 
and getting the temperature right may not really be too much to ask, but we should also be demanding that the building environment is safe, properly monitored and ventilated with clean, fresh air and um, optimised uh, to be controlled in real time. I think also uh, reduced ventilation rates, poor filtration and poor control philosophies are all directing us to poor working environments. But I guess we're caught in a vicious circle. Extremes of weather and pollution become more common, so we see a greater demand for heating, ventilation and air conditioning. But, you know, these legacy systems are placed under increasing strain. A greater demand for energy consumption is generated, mostly derived from carbon related sources and ever increasing levels of polluted air released into the atmosphere. And this is a really, really bad situation and not sustainable. In all senses of the word, it's a global challenge. So I guess this raises really two big questions. How did we get to this state? And more importantly, how are we going to get out of it? In reality, there's one single answer to these two questions, and that's innovation. For decades, there's been a shockingly small amount of innovation in the core of air conditioning technology. And it's truly a dinosaur technology, not to put too fine a point on it. Thank you. So what can you add to that, Brian? Well, I think just as Simon said, I mean, in terms of air conditioning and the last hundred years of that technology, very little has changed in terms of how the technology uh, actually works. So the conventional manufactured systems have consistently looked at uh, more efficiency from fans or from compressors or pieces of equipment when the reality lied actually in the science itself. So from an OERO perspective, our research took us back to the gas laws and how an atmosphere is actually created. And that brought us forward in a different direction. So we now have a technology that's fit for the 21st century, delivers superior atmospheres inside a building and complete atmospheres, not just heating and cooling, but while saving up to 73% of the energy. So it gives us a sustainable future for a healthy building. So thank you very much. It sounds like the technology is in place. So but in terms of confidence, what are we going to do to give people confidence to return back to the buildings? Simon, perhaps you can pitch in here. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the recent pandemic has made us aware of the importance of occupying healthy and properly ventilated buildings. It's probably also shaken us in our certainties with certain gestures and habits previously considered harmless have become a real source of questioning, such as, you know, shaking hands to say hello, touching a door handle or flipping a light switch. Um, I think we've got to look at some of the studies that have been carried out on uh, work habits. Um, and these show that around 43 percent of people who have returned to their workplace are concerned about hygiene measures that will be put into place to ensure they are working in a healthy environment. I guess we can help people um, have more confidence by increasing their ability to measure, visualise and optimise air quality. Uh, but, you know, this risk will disappear by a return to normality as that happens. Um, and we need to provide effective and easy to implement responses to reassure the occupants of both non-residential buildings and also residential buildings that the workplace or temporary residence is both safe and healthy. And I think there are three types of measures that we can, uh, we should really consider. Firstly, proactive solutions, um, which reduce the risk of contagion. Reactive solutions that ensure optimal risk management. Um, for various reasons, a contaminated person comes into a building, for example and also informational solutions relative to occupants. The measures can be put in place to give occupants full visibility uh, of the current health status of the building that they will be occupying temporarily. So let's talk about proactive measures first, such as things like measuring indoor air quality. Well, ASHRAE published a uh, Buildings Readiness Reopening Guideline, and that guide recommends an increase in ventilation rates an increase in the rate of air renewal, uh, maybe the installation of things like HEPA filters and the eradication of bacteria and inactive viruses in the HVAC systems. But more than that, I think working with Brian and Oero, we've developed a solution that's taken the industry by storm, the Atomics Air Module. 
Uh, and this delivers a unique patented air distribution technology that I'm sure Brian would be happy to explain. And it's using the uh, Brownian motion to increase comfort air quality and diffuse harmful particles from being a threat to you and to the health of the building. Okay, well, Brian, maybe you can tell us more. Certainly, Brad. So the basis for the Oero Atomics Air technology is to look at the gases themselves and the particles and how they're dissipated across the space. And so that's where we use the principle of gas gases and diffusion rather than convection flows. So traditionally, a convection flow enables the particles that we breathe out, such as uh, influenza or virus particles, to clump together and actually own high concentrations potentially to the next person to be breathed in. Using diffusion and the Oero technology, those particles are dissipated across the space, so they're far less harmful should anybody breathe some in because they'll get a, a much lower quantity of them. And so it's not high enough to cause uh, the infection of the disease. So the principle of particle dissipation is throughout the Oero technology. It helps us to achieve a uniform environment, but also a nice thermal temperature across the space. Thank you, Brian. Let's move now to the application side. Laura, what can you add? Yeah, to add to the confidence, uh, technology and technology visualization is really a great way to give people confidence to go back to the workplace, what it means for an engagement. The most trusted object that everybody has in their hand, in their pocket, is the smartphone. Once you're in the building, first thing, that you, when you go, what you want to see is that there's a dashboard that gives you overall information if the building is in good, healthy situation, if the indoor air quality is good, when you have this information, you can go to the open space or your workplace and just simply from your smartphone, you can manage all the uh, temperature, fan speed, lightings, etc. You can all have the personalized in information or simply on your smartphone. A distant control mission that I really like is connect people with intelligent buildings. Bring innovative solutions for better health, better spaces, and better efficiencies. So if we um, take an example of, uh, as I said, uh, my colleagues about um, indoor air quality, uh, measuring CO2 or humidity in the building, it's very important. What does it does? It gives information to ventilation to extract the polluted air that is indoors and then uh, supply the new fresh air in the building that is filters because well ventilated spaces can reduce the transmission and of course better your health and as well the productivity so this is possible uh, to measure uh, with our room device allure unitouch with the co2 sensor that's a really uh, nice design product uh, with touchless screen we touch a screen and that has this uh, possibility of measurements Another example that I'd like to give is, for example, if you are in open space. Uh, so normally what you would do, if you are a little bit chilly or you want to switch on the lights, you, you would go off from your desk, you would go then uh, on the interface, on the switch, to um, change the settings. Well, that's really not ideal and that's really not, we agree, it's not a COVID proof. So. But thanks for the application, my personify, my personify, you could change all those informations directly from the smartphone. So you can change the lights, the blinds, um, the lighting, the ventilation speed, the, the temperature directly from the smartphone. So that's really um, a great tool for everybody. And plus it can reduce uh, as well energy consumption. Great. So we've heard about the science and we've also heard about the practical applications and these will certainly help in terms of confidence. But in terms of uh, facility management and employers, what are they going to do at their level to manage workspace differently? Brian, perhaps you can start here. I think, uh, I think for everybody, the, the world we live in starts with information, as Laura says, and, and having in, the access to that information on your smart device is critical. For a asset owner or building occupier or facilities manager, the problems are very similar. What we need to do is have access to the data very quickly and simply. It needs to be displayed simply, 
But most importantly, the building systems need to be fully automated. So the building is running itself based on its intelligence. And between all of these systems now, we have a huge amount of intelligence in the building and we can genuinely upgrade these buildings to a state where they keep their occupants safe and comfortable, but they also reduce the energy very dramatically, meaning that they become very sustainable for the future and for future generations. Thank you, Brian. And Simon, what do you see at your level in terms of the way that uh, asset managers might be acting differently? Yeah, I, th I think really technology is key to this. Um, and with the advent of teleworking in the wake of the uh, pandemic, offices shared by several employees should become the norm or, uh, you know, for open spaces, especially in cities where rents are expensive and space is scarce. That means that employers are going to want to be able to detect and manage occupied or unoccupied spaces to the best, of, you know, the, the most efficient practice that they have. Social distancing, this can also be a challenge in the workplace, as we know. And we can look at technologies such as people counting sensors, and they can be implemented to understand how spaces are used to ensure that we maybe want to put partitioning of zones that could be adopted to suit the occupant needs. But I guess really in the context of a smooth return to the office, the data collected by this type of sensor, the number of people per zone, for example, can be used to ensure that the density of people per area allows for good social distance practicing. Excellent. So thank you very much, Simon. From an applications point of view, Laura, what are you putting into place to help facility yeah. managers and uh, employers? As Brian and uh, Simon indicated, for uh, for an employer to manage workspace it will be very important and the real-time data will be a key. So multi-sensors that have occupancy detection, it will be very important because they can record time, um, the occupancy over time. And for facility manager, he can get this information and decide what to do in the building with this information. For example, um, he can decide, the facility manager, if one space should be disinfected, priority to others. So it gives some kind of safety help and um, assurance for other employees in the, in the building. Uh, I want to talk as well about another application. It's my Personify Workplace, and uh, that's really a good, great tool. It's uh, the best body of uh, every office worker, I think, because it has everything in it. You have the um, uh, room positioning, you can have um, chat with your colleagues, you can have as well uh, easily uh, to, um, to make and um, note the meeting room if you want. Uh, you, you can also have the, if there's an, an incident in the building, you can show it through this application. And for facility manager as well, for example, he can indicate if in some area it's not safely to go. So people mm -hmm. on this application, they will be able, able to see that. Okay, so this is very exciting and we can see how both facility managers and building occupants are going to be able to use these technologies to control their working environments and have more well-being. However, in the question of pathogens, what's being done in terms of detection and control of pathogens? Simon, can you jump in here? Yeah, I can. Um, as Laura mentioned earlier, um, occupancy sensors make it possible to select the spaces to be uh, disinfected as a priority in order to offer the healthiest and most trustworthy spaces. Uh, once these spaces are identified, there are two methods to ensure the disinfection of surfaces. Uh, firstly, is the use of a, a cleaning team, but you know, essentially those cleaning teams need to have the right products and methodology. Who will come to disinfect the previously occupied workspace with the appropriate detergents and germicides? I mean, that's all you know needs to be uh, qualified in advance. The second point is about the reduction of path pathogens on visible services. Um, really, more importantly, in collaborative workspaces. Um, and the way that we can do that is with filtered UVC light. And that's, that has the capability of inactivating viruses uh, and killing bacteria in a short period of time at energy levels that don't harm the eyes and skin when designed within appropriate parameters, allowing it to be used in occupied or unoccupied spaces. 
And I think really, you know, for this to be effective, these devices need to operate autonomously and separately from the visible illumination systems and that are designed to provide UV doses within safety guidelines. And that's allowing us use in occupied spaces. Um, these can be integrated within the luminaires uh, and they provide pathogen reduction of both viruses and bacteria uh, and stay within the guidelines um, uh, allow us to um, to provide a safe environment for the occupant even if he wishes to stay 24 hours a day uh, in the same room without risk. Thank you, Simon. And uh, Brian, what can you tell us from Oero's point of view in terms of pathogen detection and control? Uh, well, I mean, pathogen and uh, virus detection is, is key and it's where, you know, Oero started in its research. So again, through the principle of diffusion, what we actually do is we have uh, this ability where the particles are effectively being driven back to their constituent elements of the gases. So that actually breaks down the particles and it dissipates any pathogens that are in the air. So by virtue of the science and the technology, you actually end up with the purest of air to be uh, breathed within the space. And I think you know this is a nice way of setting the atmosphere within a building without having to use additional treatments, although of course they are still valid. Uh, from an OERO perspective, the less additional treatments we have to use, of course, the less power we use. So, you know, it's all about generating a healthy, sustainable building. That was actually my next question, Brian, because we're hearing a lot about higher rates of ventilation, more sensors, more data flow. What does this mean in terms of energy consumption? Because this sounds like it takes a lot of energy. Laura, perhaps you could speak to that point. Um, concerning the sensors, yes, we do have more sensors and I promise that in the future there will be more sensors, that's for sure. But to be in contrary, more sensor doesn't mean less energy efficient. Because in the past, um, it was um, the building was managed by schedule. It means the lights were on, the fans were on, temperature at certain point was on, for example, for 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So. What helps the, 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 the sensors, what they help is that if they are acting in real time, according to human um, occupancy. So when you go in the room and uh, you enter, then the lights will be on, the fan will go on the speed, and it will be used only as you are using the space, not, not differently. People are in the center, not the building, so. Okay. And uh, you've already spoken to this point about energy consumption. Perhaps you can say a bit more, Brian? Well, I think we have to just look at the origins of all these systems. So, you know, when we come back to the OERO technology and the ability of the particles to dissipate faster, it means that we can run a truly intelligent building because all the systems are reacting in real time. So we're not reliant on prefix schedules any longer, or we don't have to be reliant on them. And the building will react as people enter and exit it. So, you know, that level of efficiency uh, is incredibly good for all of us. So both the people and the building. And we've seen a dramatic energy reduction through the OERO system, uh, anything up to 73% of the HVAC energy consumption uh, as a saving. So when we then look at the principles of putting the technology in, it makes it both financially viable and good for humans. Thank you, Brian. Simon, what would you like to add to that? I think the only thing that I would add to that is certainly things need to change. Um, in this sort of, as we start to emerge from the, uh, the post-COVID um, uh, period, uh, the one thing that I've noticed when uh, I have visited clients and buildings is the one thing that everybody seems to be doing at the moment is just increasing the ventilation rates. Now, that's well and good for the clean air environment inside the building, but it is also going to have an effect on the energy usage. So we need to start looking for new technologies such as that that, uh, that Brian is talking about to bring that energy usage under control. Um, and, you know, coming with that as part of the package is a much, much cleaner environment and, and a more comfortable environment. So I really think that the industry needs to start looking 
outside of what the norm was for uh, a, 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 a uh, environmental control system and look at those newer technologies to provide buildings that are only going to be not only going to be safe for today, but also be safe in the future. Thank you. So you've painted a very nice picture and a great landscape of what we can possibly do in the future, especially as we're equipping new buildings. But in terms of retrofitting existing buildings, how complicated is that with the technologies that you've been speaking about? Simon, would you like to start? Yes, I, th I think you know. I, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to say it's the easiest thing ever to achieve, but every building is different. Um, so we need to take a, a detailed look at what the existing plan is, whether that's going to be fit for purpose. The existing infrastructure, ductwork, cabling, electrical supply, all of those things need to be surveyed. Uh, and then from there, I know that Brian and his team, when they look at projects, I mean, they will do a detailed survey on a building and, and make a proposition from there with all the uh, design calcs properly done. So the system that goes in is, you know, exactly what we need it to be. Um, so, yes, it's, it's, it's possible. Every building is different. Uh, and every building tells its own story. So it's really about, you know, taking each building on its own merits and making the uh, the decision from there. But Brian, I don't know whether you could add, any, add anything to that. Yeah, I think I think one of the essential parts to the future being successful is to start with the client's objectives. And, you know, very often we're not terribly good at, at listening to people on what they want or even asking the right questions. So it's nice to now be in a position with a new technology where we sit down with people and say, how would you like your environment to be? What is the objective for us? It, you know, if you could have everything, what would you want? And once we have that objective clear, then we can work towards the building and the feasibility and how that's going to be engineered. And together with working with the client to program that to cause the least disruption, whether that be out of hours working or anything else, the secret to the success is to give the client what he desires. Indeed, keep the customer happy. At the same time, give them the tools that they need to make sure that they have well-being, but also an environment where they can be, be confident because that's extremely important and without going into excessive energy consumption. So you've painted a broad picture of what can be done. And before we go into our Q&A session, I'd just like to give each of you an opportunity to have a word of an ending. Laura, would you like to add something? Um, I think we all agree that uh, we are not having the easiest times with the pandemic. It's, it's difficult for everybody, but there's a um, change in the buildings. And I think it's a really positive change because the building before was really focused on the building with the um, energy efficiency that is really good. But now what we see that there's really a clear shift from building focused on the building towards building focused on the human being. Uh, to make the spaces, the places where we're going to work more uh, productive for our better health, for, for everyone that we can feel happier. So. That's, I think, a really positive change that is coming in the in the buildings and for the for the humans. So, so whatever whatever needs you have on on projects, these this tech controls have the solutions. And uh, whenever project you have, these tech controls could make it more healthier and trustworthy. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, what would you like to add, gentlemen? Simon. Well, I think for me, it, it's a real piece of uh, of market education that needs to uh, needs to happen. If we don't have an influence on the design community, then you know we'll always end up with the same kinds of buildings that we've always had. Um, we talked um, just about uh, about retrofitting projects and you know some of the complexities that are involved around those. A lot of those complexities disappear if we start designing these new buildings from the ground up using the philosophies that we've talked about today. So for me, you know, it's about that that market education that uh, that really needs to happen now. OK, Brian, one last word from Oero. Yes, I think one of the things we'd like to add is the reason we chose this tech as a partner globally is because it was the innovation and the systems which they provide that allow us to look at installing systems that are not only just groundbreaking for today, but you know we can see their reliability for the next 20 years plus, and that's essential. 
in terms of looking at technology. We don't want just want a solution for tomorrow. It has to be for the years ahead. So I think it's great to be working with a reliable partner. Thank you very much, Brian. So coming back just to the uh, visual aspect of things and helping people have more reassurance in terms of the air quality inside buildings, we mentioned the idea of a dashboard and the fact that people could navigate into a building using their GPS and then suddenly they could walk in and see a dashboard and that would give a certain number of indicators in terms of how things are going in that building. Do you have any practical applications or examples of what that looks like already in existing buildings? Could I ask you, Laura? I think uh, you should better ask to the people on on the <laughs> on the field. <laughs> okay, I'll come to Simon then. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> yeah, certainly. There's uh, there's a number of projects that already exist. I mean, we record all of this data in buildings, and data is about the amount of people that are in the buildings, where they're located what temperatures, humidity is, what the CO2 levels are, what room availability there is, um, and, and also the building index. So certainly those dashboard screens do exist. Um, and it's really, you know, to, to prepare one of those is really around what the client wants. As Brian said, it's about engaging with that client and delivering exactly what they need. So the data is available and we can achieve that. Brian, would you have, like to add anything in terms of dashboards? Yes, I, th I think uh, number one is keep the dashboard simple. Most of our clients like to just see, you know, a green traffic light to say it's healthy and fit and well for them to enter into this building, um, you know, and uh, not uh, create, uh, shall we say, some of the graphing and complexities that we've seen in the past. You know, the focus needs to be on a nice, clean, uh, forward message. So keep things simple. Absolutely. I'm not sure if we have any other questions coming from our audience. So I think not. And in that case, this concludes this sequence of DCTV. We hope you've enjoyed this session on healthy and trustworthy buildings. First of all, I'd like to thank our experts, Laura, Brian, and much. Simon. Thank you for your precious insights. I'd also like to thank our audience for their active participation. And I look forward to the next sequence on air quality. In the meantime, stay safe and take care.